Grace and peace. Welcome to your daily devotionals by the TCC staff. With social distancing ending soon and things looking like it's starting to get back to normal, one concern that's certainly um, on the media a lot and probably in most of our minds is the economic impact of this crisis. Millions of people in this country have already either lost their jobs or have had a significant reduction in their income in the past few months. And so with the crisis looking like it's far from being over and um, the potential economic impact greater than we expect, it seems wise for us to turn to scripture to seek its wisdom for a time when our financial security seems to be at risk. So let's turn to scripture and go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 6 to 12 to see what it can teach us about this. Let's read it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we bought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Thus says the Lord. So the letter of 1 Timothy is a letter from Paul to Timothy uh, for a church that has a lot of very bad problems, right? And, it, and in it, there is very practical and specific instructions as to how to reform this church. And one of the major problems that the church has is that there are some teachers there who are teaching some deviant theology that is contrary to the teachings of Jesus. And Paul here had some pretty choice word for them um, in the section of the letter before what we just read. And one of the things that Paul rebukes them for is the fact that they were using godliness as a means of gain, of trying to get profit. So then Paul takes a turn in what we just read and addresses the church to talk about how it is they should view their faith in relation to their wealth, their wealth in relation to their godliness. So let's dive into it. So in verse 6, Paul immediately corrects what these false teachers got twisted. They thought that godliness can equal more profit. But Paul says, that the true formula is that godliness plus contentment equals great profit, right? And he explains this in verse 7, right? It is because our life on earth is temporary. It is fleeting. Or using the language of Ecclesiastes, whatever we have on earth is vanity. We cannot take anything that we want on earth when we have to finally and eventually leave this world. So in verse 8, Paul tells us, what do we actually need to be content? Food to eat, clothes to wear. Now maybe some of you might protest at this point and say, uh, what about education? What about living in a good and safe neighborhood? What about our careers or whatever else it is that you might be working towards or, or looking forward to? Now don't get me wrong, right? These things are very good to have and very helpful in making you uh, advance further in life and maintaining or improving your standard of living. But to be content, which is necessary for true, for great gain, Paul says, you don't actually need any of that. Then in verse 9 to 10, Paul explains to us the danger of thinking that we need more than these things to be content. Because the idea that we need to be rich, that in order to be content, we need to have an abundance of possessions and wealth, it's a trap. It will lead us to temptation and lead us to have some foolish or harmful desires. Now many of us, myself included, would probably prefer to battle these foolish and harmful desires if given the choice, trusting ourselves to eventually overcome them rather than living with the fear of anxiety of possibly not having enough to be happy. But Paul reminds us here that the consequences are serious. That these things, these desires, will ultimately lead to our ruin and destruction. 
And so because of this, Paul concludes in verse 9 that the love of money, verse 10, I mean, that the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And satisfying our love of money has some serious consequences, leading us away from our faith and harming ourselves. Right? I don't know about you guys, though, but it's pretty hard for me not to love money. Right? Money can get us some pretty nice things. And we do need it for some essential things in life. So Paul is not saying here that it's wrong to try to earn money and financially be responsible or independent. We still need to eat and have clothes. But he is saying that it is very dangerous to simplistically judge how much gain we have or how much we've succeeded based on the numbers of our bank accounts or the bottom lines on our balance sheets. That is to make money our master instead of our servant. It is a slippery slope that can lead to destruction. And Jesus himself said that you cannot serve two masters. You will either hate one and love the other. So in verse 11 and 12, Paul explains the gain that we should be pursuing, how it is we should be measuring our success. Right? In verse 11, he says, O oh man of God, flee from these things. But pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, gentleness, steadfastness. Now, what are these things, right? Spiritual fruit. Our growth in these virtues is what really matters in the end. These things are what God will honor when we have to leave the earthly things that we have and return to our Maker to give an account for our lives. So how do you pursue these things? Verse 12 teaches us. Fight the good fight. See, Paul knows that this isn't easy. It's a battle. It's a struggle that's even harder than satisfying our desires with money, trying to earn money to do that. But Paul is encouraging us here to keep at it, to persevere, right? And how do we do that? We're going to take hold of eternal life that we're called to and we have confessed of. Meaning, that if we are to pursue spiritual gifts, we need to cling tightly to the cross, the source of our eternal life, by reminding ourselves constantly of what Jesus had done for us and what He has promised to us. Now, this is the difficult thing that we must do. But from a material sense, all we need to do this is food in our belly and clothes on our back. Brothers and sisters, in the wake of the economic disaster that seems to be coming, it is important for us not to be deceived by the love of money and destroy ourselves by thinking that money will bring us the contentment and peace that we seek. For as long as we have food and clothing, we can still produce spiritual fruit by the power of the gospel when we look at the cross. And we will still profit and this is what matters in the end. And this is what matters most to God. So keep fighting. But if you are in a place where you cannot feed yourself or clothe yourself, we beg you, please tell us. It is very difficult for us to find out otherwise in the situation. Right? And we want to help you. Because it is the duty and delight of the church to care for its members however we can. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we are anxious, Lord, of what is coming. Um, we rely on our wealth often, and it seems like we're going to lose a lot of it in the coming weeks. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to turn us to the cross. Show us, Lord, make us realize that you will give us the desires of our hearts, and it is in you alone that we find true satisfaction and contentment. That, all, that the birds of the air get fed and the flowers of the field, fields get clothed and we are much more precious to you than them. Help us to trust in you, Lord. Our hearts are prone to wander. And our hearts are prone to be anxious. But you are our sure and steady anchor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.